chapter 3, the book of Numbers. Well, the children of Israel under Moses, they have been there at the bottom or the foot of Mount Sinai, also known as Mount Horeb, for a whole year. They've been there. Exodus chapter 20 sort of said, okay, once we're here, then starting in chapter 20, book of Exodus, really to the end of the book, pretty much in catalogs what's going to happen in that next year. What does happen? Well, they put together all the tabernacle, and then they build all the articles and elements, and they train the priests. And we're seeing here tonight that the priests have to be a direct descendant of Aaron. Remember, there are 12 tribes in Israel that comes from Jacob. You have Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, and Jacob has 12 sons. Those 12 sons will become the 12 patriarchs, or... The 12 tribes of Israel. Well, one of those sons is a son named Levi. And Moses and his older brother Aaron are from the tribe of Levi. Let's pay close attention to that. There's some interesting things we'll check out. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now, these are the records of Aaron and Moses when the Lord spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai. And these are the names of the sons of Aaron. Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer and Ithamar. Please notice there are four sons of Aaron. You know the story. Some of you already go, yep, those first two boys, Abihu, Nadab, they get fired by the Lord, literally. Yeah, it's always a good idea when you're cruising through your scriptures, have your Bible dictionary nearby, and all the names have meanings. Nadab's name means want to or willing to. He's the firstborn. He's one of the ones that's going to take it on himself to go do and worship his own way. It's not going to work out well. His next brother is Abihu. Abihu's name means father, Abba, Abba, Abihu, father or God worshiper. Nadab, I want to, Abihu, worship the father. Eliezer, he means God's comforter. Do you know he has 16 sons? Um, Mrs. Eliezer, actually um, more than just one, but between them they have 16 boys. 16! <laughs> Debbie, you have two. Can you imagine having 16? And then there's Ithamar, the baby. His name is interesting. It means coast of palms. If you've been uh, oh, swimming a long time there in the ocean, perhaps, or the Mediterranean, and uh, you haven't eaten for a while, when you arrive at the coast, that's a good place for palm trees. Did you know that palm trees, there's lots of different species, but overall palm trees are one of the only fruiting trees that as they get older, they bear more and more fruit. Um, most uh, fruit-bearing trees, when they get older, they start to lessen their yield of fruit, not the palm tree. So can you imagine this idea that on the coast where there's plenty of moisture, what kind of fruit-bearing palms would those be? Interesting that, that, uh, that they are named this. Aaron names them. Well, um, Eliezer has 16 boys, and then um, Ithamar, he has eight. The first two, Nadab and Abihu, have no sons. First Chronicles, right in your margin here, First Chronicles chapter 24. First Chronicles 24. We won't turn there, but it's going to list all 24 sons of Eliezer and Ithamar. And did you know that uh, here in a minute we're going to see that God is going to take all those 24 boys and they're going to put it on the schedule. And those 24 sons, and of course they'll have descendants after them, but that's going to become the 24 courses or divisions of the priests. That works out nicely because we have 12 months a year. And if you divide that in half, and that means you get each course of, each course of or division of priests is going to serve for two weeks. Now, why is that important? Because that never changes. And remember, the Jews have that uh, lunar calendar. They don't have a, 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 a man-made sort of a paper calendar because the humans keep changing the calendars around. So between the phases of the moon, that's some pretty precise timing. And why is that kind of cool? Hold your finger, I'll show you. Go to the book of Luke chapter 1. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke chapter 1. Uh, how many of you guys know that the Bible is always its own best explainer? It surely is. And if the Bible ever mentions a specific, it's there for a reason. So chapter 1, book of Luke, look down there to verse 5. This is, of course, uh, going to be the birth of John the Baptist. So Luke chapter 1, verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias. That's going to be John the B's dad. He's of the, what? Division of Abijah. Right in your margin there, 1 Chronicles 24. In 1 Chronicles 24, we know that Mr. Abijah is the eighth division. Most of you, Steve, you are such a nerd. So what? If you do the math on this, we know what time of year this is. Does that make sense? Because you've got 24 priestly divisions, each of them go two weeks at a time. And because of the precise nature of how the Jews keep records of time, we know what time of year this is. Well, then what happens? You know the story. Um, Zacharias comes out and he sees an angel and he's all, angel, and then the angel said, you're going to have a son with, with ancient Elizabeth. You, ancient Zechariah and ancient Elizabeth. And he's all, what? We are well past childbearing. So the angel says, well, um, I'm going to keep you mute until John the Baptist, the miracle baby boy, is born. So then if you do the math on that, you take a typical gestation period of, of uh, John the Baptist. And as I've joked before, Remember, him and his wife, they have been barren, and they've prayed all their lives, and they've pretty much forgotten. And then when the angel says, no, it's going to happen now, <laughs> what do you suppose Zacharias did? You think he waited around? I've joked before, no, no, he stopped by the store and got some Barry White albums, and he got, you know, her favorite dinner, and, you know, wow, and magic, it was happening. So I'm going to give it not too much time, and let's begin Elizabeth's gestation period Remember, she's six months along when Mary hears from the angel Gabriel that she's going to have a baby, another miraculous birth. She runs and tells Elizabeth, and they're related, and the Bible happens to mention that it's in the sixth month. And so that's easy math. All that is to say, and we've got some tapes on it if you'd like to run that down, Jesus, we have a pretty good idea when he was born. He was not born on December the 25th. He was not. He was likely born in the fall. And if the gestation periods are exactly on the button, then potentially Jesus might have been born on the Feast of Tabernacles. Why? John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word dwelt among us, verse 14, Gospel of John. And the word became flesh and dwelt. And that word in the Greek is not dwelt, it's tabernacled. And God zipped up a human suit and he tabernacled with men. What if Jesus was born um, in the fall on the feast of tabernacles? I told you, nerd alert, watch out. All right, back to our study. So where do these uh, 24 courses of priests come from? They come from Eliezer and Ithamar, not Nadab and Abihu. Verse 3. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the anointed priests, who he consecrated to minister as priests. Remember, they've been getting all the stuff together. They've been uh, putting the temple, or I should say the tabernacle together. And I'm going to take you to the place where uh, God fills it. It's going to be awesome. Verse 4, Nadab, want to. Abihu, God worshiper, had died before the Lord when they offered profane fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. And they had no children. So Eliezer and Ithamar ministered as priests in the presence of Aaron and their father. Let's check that out. Hold your finger here. And let's go back to the book of, and write in your margin here, Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus 10, verses 1 through 9. Let's actually look at this. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and let's go to chapter 10. Chapter 10, let's read the story. 
Let's actually start in chapter 9, verse 24. 23. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting. We're in Leviticus 9, verse 23. And came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. What's the glory of the Lord? That's the Shekinah glory. That's that cloud. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. This is evidently one of the very first times they're going to use this tabernacle. It took them a whole year to build it, or close to a year. And all the priests, remember, as we're going to see here in a minute, you've got to be directly descended from Aaron. And so they have the right uniform on. They've got the special anointing. If we were to go back to Exodus, it was an exacting process. Baths and cleansing and, and the clothes consecrated in just a certain fashion. It was kind of almost exhausting, really. It used to be before you went to the presence of the Lord, there was a lot of legwork that had to be done. How many of you praise God since the cross? We don't need all that foo-foo. But it never hurts to go back and check it out and look at the models because it's a lot of insight. Well, here, this is one of the first times they've been building this tabernacle for all this time. Remember, you got all the wood that are in planks and they're overlaid with gold and they're sitting in silver sockets and bars running through. You got the curtain over the top with all the beautiful stitching work of the cherubim. You've got the four layers. You've got the brazen altar outside. It's fired up. You've got the laver inside. You've got the golden lamp stand to the right, the table of showbread. Right ahead, you have the veil. And in front of the veil there was the golden altar of incense. And we know what's behind the veil, the Ark of the Covenant. And that Shekinah starts between those two angels on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, the shadow of their wings that's the mercy seat, and that's where the cloud originates from. And God shows up. Chapter 10, verse 1. Then Nadab and Abihu, you know that those are Aaron's two oldest boys, the sons of Aaron, each took a censer and they put fire in it. They put incense on it, and they offered profane fire before the Lord. Well, what did they do? We don't know exactly what they did, but if you keep reading, probably they were drinking and they were probably inebriated. And also, likely what's happening is you're supposed to take the censer, you're supposed to put the coal, you're supposed to take that smoldering coal and pour that beautiful incense. And they're supposed to do that when it is the appropriate time. What's happened here is they've done all of that. And God's Shekinah shows up and everybody's all, whoa! And Nadab and Abigo, Abihu, they're all, this is cool. What do you say we go back down there and we do it again while everybody's looking? They offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. Real quickly. We can love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind and strength. Amen. And there is a tremendous freedom in worshiping him. But please notice that before Jesus paid for all sin, worshiping the Lord was very prescribed. God says, I really, really want it to look exactly like this. It's within all of us as humans, we want to go, okay, well, yeah, but. And we want to add a bunch of stuff to it. That's why we here at Arvis, we try to say, we want to worship in such a way that you can find an example somewhere in the scriptures. So yes, there's a great freedom to come and worship the Lord. But remember, number one, no matter how God leads you, uh, like Blake, to dance. When I said Blake is going to dance, Nicole said, the spirit of expectation is here. <laughs> can you dance before the Lord? What's the answer? Yes, because they did it here in the Old Testament. Can you stand before the Lord? Yes, because there's models for it. How about kneel? Of course. How about on our face? Yes. How about sitting quietly? Yeah, that's in there too. But we are quick to point out, however God leads you to worship here at Harvest, be mindful and not to be distracting to anybody else. So when Blake does want to bust out in a, in a dance... We would encourage Blake to stand in the back. In Blake's case, the way back. back there. <laughs> now, 
Do some churches have dancers proceed right down the center aisle? Yes. But they probably, there's a certain culture, I would imagine, that that's not unusual. So the point of it is, worship should never, ever be distracting someone else's focus to see me. And by the way, is that within most of us humans? You know, we like to kind of be seen doing cool stuff. If we're not careful, we'll do the raising the hand things, and it really is from that pouring out of your own heart. Praise God. But if there's anything like I'm raising my hand, like everybody else, that's not the wrong, that's not the right way. And in this case, and praise God we're not in this economy, look at verse 2. So fire went out from the Lord, and what? (laughs) Devoured them. And they, what? Died before the Lord. Can you imagine the band? Woo! And the spirit of worship is praised. And the band is going. The singers are singing. What a worship service. And then there, here comes uh, Nadab and Abu. Huh? Everybody? And then boop, they fall over dead. The band, boop, boop, boop. What? The singers, uh, huh? That, what is it? Dragging the needle across the old record vinyl. What? And they died. They died. I suppose there's a New Testament kind of similarity in Acts chapter 5. Remember what was happening there? Uh, that's post, post-resurrection after the cross of Jesus. But you had Ananias and Sapphira. They saw that everybody or many people were moved by the Lord to sell articles that they had and give it to the church at large. Well, they did the same thing, but they were doing it with what? Everybody watching us? Peter, operating under one of the spiritual gifts, probably the discernment of spirits, certainly uh, wisdom, he says, is this all of the money? Because they were sort of indicating that, look at all the money we gave. We sold a piece of property for whatever it was, and this is every last cent of it. In other words, look at us squeeze our pockets dry for God. That's how much we love God around here. Peter Mm -mm. you holding back now there's nowhere that God says you have to give it all but what were they doing some people were giving the whole amount they weren't which is no big deal but what were they sort of communicating to the rest of the crowd oh yeah and what happened to them they died and the Bible says and great fear came upon the congregation I guess so. Do people sometimes showboat a little bit? Is some or any portion of our worship really not for God? It's to tell other people kind of how, kind of how I'm loving the, the Lord right now. There's a great grace whenever we worship God, praise his name. But I want you to notice in the Old Testament, here it was. In this instance, God is saying, no posers. No posers in my presence. Verse three. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord is saying. By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. Who got closer than Moses and Aaron and the four boys? Nobody did. There's a great privilege and responsibility. By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. What does that mean? What would you do as a father seeing your boys suddenly die? It shook him up. Now watch this. Aaron, don't twitch. Now is Aaron a father? He sure is. He's got the vestments of the high priest. He's got the anointing oil and he's got the uniform on. He's still human. And being a real feeling human being, his sons have just died right in front of him. He's going to have an emotion or two about that. But notice what Moses says. He's saying, Aaron, my older brother, you will have time to mourn as a father. But right now, you can't twitch. You can't go, oh, my sons, why? Because you're standing in the office of high priest. And when those boys fell over, everybody looked at their dad. And if Aaron, 
who's representing God goes, <laughs> what is he representing God's attitude toward what just happened? Like God is what? Pernicious. Why do I take some time in going over that? Because... Well, at least here at Harvest, I know that it's really important for us. If we're on the platform here, um, are we just humans? Of course we are. But we've got this verse right here over the green room as you walk out. This verse, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. It's right in the door. We see it every time we ascend to the platform. Because when we ever stand in the office of worship leader, pastor... Elder, does God take those offices very seriously? Do the humans always take those offices very seriously? There's an Old Testament model for when you stand for God, be certain you are doing everything within your power to represent him in the fruit of the Spirit. Anyway, Verse 4, so Moses called Mishael and El Safan and the sons of Uziel, uh, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and they carried the guys, the two dead bodies, by their tunics out of the camp as Moses had said. See, the model has to stay complete. If Aaron would have went, oh my goodness, he's misrepresenting God. He has to represent God right now. You're going to have time to mourn. But right now you have to be, this is right. This needed to happen. My boys were misbehaving and misrepresenting God. God is right to judge them. Now watch this, for 6. And Moses said to Aaron, to Eliezer and Ithamar, those are the two remaining boys, his sons, do not uncover your heads and don't tear your clothes. Because when you were really like, oh no, the custom was you would tear your clothes. Don't do that. Don't twitch, comma, lest you what? You too. They weren't the ones who, who were drunk potentially. They weren't the ones completely acting out of line. But they too, along with Aaron, are representing God. You can't twitch either. Lest you die and the wrath come upon all the people. Harvest, please understand that when it comes to the presence of the Lord, God's holiness is sacred. Sacred. And we're so used to potentially his beautiful grace. Back to uh, numbers now. We're so used to his beautiful grace. If we're not careful, we'll come traipsing in with our muddy boots, you know. And in fact, we'll even have an attitude. I don't like that song. Turn up the air conditioning. Turn down the music. And we have this notion that a church service is for me. It is not. A worship service like this is not for us. It is for him. And that Old Testament picture, I know of some worship groups that will hire from the, they call the, uh, they call the musicians local, and when it's Easter or Christmas, they want to expand their orchestra, they will hire musicians. It's not uncommon. Um, I'm thinking of years and years ago, one of the great worship bands in the Truckee Meadows, this is many years ago. Goodness, I want to say this maybe 40 years ago. Wow. Rick, have I been here that long? Do I look that old? Yeah, don't answer that. And um, they had a, a wonderful band. And then I found out that one of the reasons they had such a wonderful band was because they populated the stage with professional musicians. Okay. But in the light of, Le of Leviticus chapter 10, what do you think about that? I don't know. Now, will God use it? Of course, he can use anything. He can use a donkey for crying out loud. But I know here at Harvest, this particular shepherd is trying to be sensitive to the fact 
that not just anyone should stand up on a platform and lead worship or teach a Bible study. It's pretty important stuff. Back to, uh, we're in chapter 3. We are now in verse, let's read verse 4 once again. Nadab, I want to. Abihu, I want to worship God. They had died before the Lord when they offered profane fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. We just read that. And they had no children. So Eleazar and Ithamar, Eleazar means comforter. It's really, uh, what's one of the monikers of the Holy Spirit? The comforter. And Ithamar, fruit. With your Jesus glasses on, I want to worship the Father, but if you do it wrong, stuff could die. But if you hang on to the comforter, if you will, the Holy Spirit, and you mind your fruit, you're going to be used powerfully by the Lord. What a powerful model. The power is not in the program harvest, the censers, the uniforms, the anointing oil, even the Ark of the Covenant. The power, or His glory, is in obedience. Strange fire is, can we do that even today? I think so. I think there's lots of strange fire. Gimmicks. Um, it could be stuffing your, your platform musicians with a bunch of, 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 uh, of um, what do they call them? Um, star players, whatever. Um, gimmicks and even programs versus how God says to do it. The power is not in the programs and it's not in the gimmicks. God's power comes from a humble, teachable heart. If we come into the sanctuary with a notion of, I'm going to push aside all that other stuff and I'm here for him, not for me. What a powerful model. If I am using some gimmicks, relying on other people, maybe, or a church program for my support system, could that be a form of, of um, strange fire? Instead of, it's a daily thing that I meet with the Lord. Me and my Bible and my teachable heart, I will never burn out, pardon the pun. I know a whole lot of people, in fact, they talk about sabbaticals and I know a whole lot of ministers over the years that burn out. And I'm not going to try to hazard a guess as to every single case, but I do know that in many of the churches I've been involved with, especially some of the very larger ones, you know who the most exhausted humans were in the entire place? It was the pastoral staff. Why? Because they've been come to expect it that everybody, everybody gets to plug their IV tube into them. And so... There's a notion that if your church is slamming and happening, you better have lots of stuff. And you know who facilitates all those? Talented people who are hired for their motor and their ability to pull off these events in a, in a professional manner. It doesn't surprise me that often you can only do that for so long, and I know many over the years, and they burn out. And then this picture always comes to my mind. Yeah, Nadab and Abihu, they burned out. <laughs> but I don't know that Ithamar and Eliezer did. I think the names maybe tell a story. Exactly opposite of that ministry model, those who rely on God's comforter, Eliezer, will have much fruit like Ithamar. Those are never going to burn out. Verse 5. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, bring the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron the priest that they may serve him. Why Levi? I'm glad you asked. Hold your finger here. Let's go back again. Let's go this time to the book of Exodus. Book of Exodus chapter 32. Let's find out why does God choose the Levites? Chapter 32, the book of Exodus. Let's start with verse number 19. This is Moses coming down from the mountain. He's been on Mount Sinai, and he's been there for 40 days. And what are the people underneath the mountain doing? They're drumming their fingers. Where's Moses? Where's he at? And then they start saying, we don't even know what happened to him. Yeah, like he brought him all this way just so he could bolt. So you know the story. They take off their earrings and gold things, and they... Uh, 
they give it to Aaron and they say, make us an image. You remember what the image was? The image was uh, Donald Trump. No, it wasn't Donald Trump. The image was a golden calf. And why a calf? There's probably reasons for that. Likely going back to the, uh, the Egyptian honcho god Apis, the bull, who has the, the moon between his horns. But I don't know. But then they're, and then they start partying down. So Moses, this is day 40, so he's coming down. He's got the Ten Commandments, or he's got the commandments under one arm. And then he's got the blueprints for the tabernacle under the other. And he, he says, uh, he sees Joshua kind of outside. And he says, what's going on? And, and they both hear this, and they're just, there's a big party going on. Verse 19. This is Exodus chapter 32, verse 19. So it was as soon as he, Moses, came near the camp that he saw a calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot. And he cast the tablets out of his hands and he broke them at the foot of the mountain there at Mount Horeb. Then he took the calf which they had made and he burned it in fire and ground it into powder. And he scattered it on water and he made the children of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, What did these people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? Watch Aaron's response, verse 22. So Aaron said to them, Don't let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people, how they are set on evil. Um, verse 23, And they said to me, Make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of Egypt, we do not know what have come of him. Um, look at verse 24. And I said, whoever has any gold, let him break it off. So they gave it to me and I put it in the fire and pop and poof, this cap jumped right out. Right. Now verse 25. Now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, King James, naked, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies. Because remember, you got enemies looking at these people. They're going to come into our land, so there's spies looking out. What are these people like? You know, and they see them naked. Arr! Naked, not naked and afraid, but they would be naked and dancing, I guess. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and he said, Whoever is of the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of... Levi, circle that, gathered themselves together to him because I kind of think they know what's going on. Watch what happens. Verse 27. And he, Moses, said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put a what? Sword on his side and go in and out from the entrance to entrance throughout the camp and let every man kill his Brother, every man his friend, and every man his neighbor. Are you serious? Verse 28. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men of the people, friends, and neighbors, they died that day. Right in your margin there, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. When the law comes down here under Moses, it busts all the people naked and dancing, so 3,000 die. When the Holy Spirit is poured out, Acts chapter 2, do you remember the specific detail? How many people got saved? 3,000. It's a picture. The law kills. It's grace that saves. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 29. Moses said, consecrate yourselves today before the Lord, or to the Lord, that he may bestow on you a blessing this day. For every man has opposed his son and his brother, speaking to the Levites. And now it came to pass, um, that's good enough. Go back to the book of Numbers. Let me put this, or let me get this straight. Why didn't the other 11 tribes, why didn't anybody say, all right, Moses, we blew it. We're so very sorry. Why did the Levites only come across? They knew what was about to happen. They knew that God was going to have them use the sword to deal with rebellious family members, rebellious neighbors, rebellious friends. 
Nobody was willing to do that except the tribe of Levi. Put my Jesus glasses on. That's, that's really something. I really got to thinking about that. Is the word of God often likened to a sword? So I think the model is, is there. But have you noticed that as a rule, most of us, we want to be liked more than we want to be righteous? Especially in a church setting. We want people to look at us and like what it is that we're doing. And whenever we use the Bible, especially in the case of Matthew 18, it happens. You say to a brother or a sister, well, here's the behavior and here's what God's word says. And, you, you know, you got to stop. And either they will hear you, yay, you've won a brother or a sister. But if they won't, what are you supposed to do next? You're supposed to take two or more. And if they won't hear them, what are you supposed to do when they don't listen to the body either? You have to disconnect them. Is that hard or is that easy? It's really hard. Jesus' class is on. Why the Levites? Is it because one of the most important Holy Spirit DNA for proper biblical leadership, you have to sometimes use the sword? For a brother, for a neighbor, for a family member. And it would seem that the only tribe willing to prefer God's righteousness, God's word over relationships was the tribe of Levi. And God never forgot that. For your consideration, even in the church today, Pastor, don't crowd us. Give us something that we want to hear and we'll pack the pews in the tithing box. But when a pastor does speak and teach the whole counsel of the Lord, even the hard stuff, we don't like that. We want to go down the street. Verse seven. Anyway, they, the Levites, shall attend to his needs and the needs of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of meeting. Remember the three tribes on four sides of the tabernacle. Who gets to camp, pardon me, who gets to camp closest to the house of God? The Levites do. They're going to be next to the tabernacle of meeting to do the work of the tabernacle. Also, they shall attend to all the furnishings of the tabernacle of meeting and to the needs of the children of Israel. So they're going to be kind of ministers as well. Now, we're going to see here in a minute um, Levi and Moses are of the tribe of Levi, but the priests proper have to be directly descended from Aaron. Let me rephrase it. All priests are descendants of Aaron. They may be Levites, but not all Levites are priests. Does that make sense? The others who aren't directly descended, the Levites, they're going to still be ministering in and around the tabernacle, but they won't be doing the priestly stuff itself. Verse 8. Also they shall attend to all the furnishings of the tabernacle of meeting and to the needs of the children of Israel. So they're going to take care of the physical needs of Israel as well. When they get to the promised land, uh, we're going to see 48 cities that the Levites get. They don't have a tract of land like the other tribes, but they are to be interdispersed throughout all of Israel because they're going to teach people God's word and also to judge. To do the work of the tabernacle, verse 9, and you shall give the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are given entirely to him from among the children of Israel. So you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall attend to the priesthood. All priests are descendants of Aaron. Not all Levites are priests. But the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Verse 11. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, now behold, I myself have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of every firstborn. If we were to cruise back into um, Exodus, we find out that their very first camp, God says, I want you to consecrate every firstborn who opens the womb for the humans and the animals. Those belong to me. Did you know that 
every family was supposed to have a priest. That's how it was originally intended. But by the time they get to partying and what have you, and only Levi comes across, now it's different. Israel was supposed to be priests and examples and lights and models for the whole planet. But by the time we get done with the golden calf, now there's only the Levites. Verse 12, now behold, I myself have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of every firstborn. Every firstborn was supposed to be the priests. Now it's just the Levites. The firstborn who opens the womb among the children of Israel. Therefore, are now, after the golden calf thing, the Levites shall be mine. Verse 13, because all the firstborn are mine. And on the day that I struck all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself or set apart for myself all the firstborn in Israel. They were supposed to be the priests. Both men and beasts, they shall be mine, I am the Lord. That was God's original intent. All firstborn were to be the priest to all the nations on the earth. Now it's very different. And because of that, we've been seeing that in Acts chapter 10 and 11. By the time the, the film gets fast forwarded to Peter, now instead of being a light to the Gentiles, what do the Jews typically think of Gentiles? They're awful. You know God only made them to stoke the fires of hell. Oh, my. Why are the Levites chosen for godly ministry? And we read that, pardon me, Exodus 32. They were willing to unsheath the sword. God's righteousness, God's word over relationships. It's a rare commodity these days, and I wonder if that may be one of the reasons why we perhaps aren't seeing Book of Acts type miraculous in many churches. I don't know. Every other tribe shrank away because they preferred being liked more than being righteous. God says, that's why I'm trusting effective, powerful ministry to the Levites. <clears throat> I wrote my margin here. There are many ministries in a typical church. What part of God's word will I not do because I prefer to be liked versus be righteous or biblical? Verse 14. Then the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, saying, Number the children of Levi by their father's houses and by their families, and you shall number every male from a month old and above. So Moses numbered them according to the word of the Lord as he was commanded. Verse 17. These were the sons of Levi by their names, Gershon, Koath, and Moriah. We're going to see now that we're going to take the remaining um, Levites and we're going to divide them into three camps. Verse 18, these are the names of the son of Gershon by their families, Libni and Shimei. The sons of Kohath by their families. So we have Amram and Ezahar and Hebron and Uzael. And then the sons of Merai. So you could circle those if you'd like. Gershon, Kohath, and Merai. Verse 21, from Gershon, here is what they're going to be doing came the family of the Libanites and the family of the Shemites. These are the families of the Gershonites, those who were numbered according to the number of all the males from one month old and above. Of those who were numbered, there are 7,500. The families of the Gershonites were the camp behind the tabernacle. Remember, the door always faced east, so this group is going to camp on the other side or on the west. Verse 24, and the leader of the father's house of the Gershonites was Eliasaph, the son of Lael. The duties of the children of Gershon of the tabernacle of meeting, here's what they did. They were to look after the tabernacle, the tent with its covering, the screen and the door. Remember, there's a screen in the front that'll get you into the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the courtyard, and there was another door behind the the labored, and then, of course, the veil itself between the Holy of Holies and the room in front called the Holies. Well, anyway, the Gershonites were going to watch out for the screen for the door of the tabernacle of meeting, the screen for the door of the court, and the hangings of the court, which are around. So that whole courtyard was divided up by these sheets that were run between the posts, and that demarked or set out the outer court. So they had to wash all those and keep them clean and and keep them uh, in good condition. 
that are around the tabernacle and the altar. They're cords because they were, um, they were put in a base and then there was cords that held them up from falling over. So they're going to look after all that stuff. The hangings of the court, which are around the tabernacle and the altar, and their cords, according to all the work related to them. So total number of Gershonites, 7,500. They're going to be looking after, they're responsible for the woven material and the animal skins which covered the tabernacle. The Gershonites are not priests, but they are fulfilling, nonetheless, a very important role. Verse 27. And now the next group of thirds. This is the Kohath group. Kin, the family of the Amramites, the family of the Izharites, the family of the Hebronites, and the family of the Uzielites. <laughs> um, I almost, a uh, beer came to mind. What is that, Bud Light? No, no, not those guys. These were the families of the Kohathites, according to the number of all the males from a month old and above. There were 18,600 keeping charge of the sanctuary, the family of the children of Kohath. Where the camp? They were camped to the south side of the tabernacle. And the leader of the fathers of the house of the families of the Kohathites was Elizaphan, the son of Uzael. Their duties included they looked after the ark. So when God is going to move, everybody had a job to do. We're going to see next week. They would take the, the veil. Of course, the, the ark is behind. This is the Holy of Holies. Here's the holy place. And then we're outside is the outer court. You come in here. Nobody was to go into the Holy of Holies except the high priest once a year. So they would take the veil and they would move it forward. And then they would drape it over the ark of the covenant. Another covering was to go on top of that. Then the poles are run through the rings. And then they would move the ark under this drapery uh, to the next place. And then when they get set up, they would reverse the process. And they would bring the veil back up and walk backwards and hook it back up. So then nobody ever treads, as it were, into the Holy of Holies, except the, the high priest. Verse 32. And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, was to be chief over the leaders of the Levites with oversight of those who kept charge of the sanctuary. So the Kohathites, they were 8,600, and they were in charge of the furniture of the tabernacle, the altars, table of showbread, the lampstand, and the ark. Verse 33. Now from Mirai came the family of the Mahalites, and the family of the Mushites, these were the families of Mari. Mari. Verse 34, and those who were numbered according to the number of all the males from a month old and above were 6,200. And the leader of the father's house of the family of Mari was Zuriel, and the son of Abihail. Nobody's saying, Steve, you're doing a pretty good job with these names. You really should. I do terrible names. Now watch the next one I'm really going to butcher. These were the camp to the north side of the tabernacle. And the appointed duty of the children of Mary I included the boards of the tabernacle. Its bars, its pillars, its sockets. Those are those silver bases at the bottom. Its utensils and all the work related to them. And the pillars of the court all around were with their sockets and their pegs and their cords. So the family of Mary I numbered 6,200 they were responsible for the framework of the tabernacle. Verse 38. Moreover, those who were to camp before the tabernacle, they were on the east. Here comes the guys to the east. Guess who those guys are? That's the front door, you know. That's going to be for Moses and Aaron and his sons, keeping charge of the sanctuary to meet the needs of the children of Israel, but the outsider who came near was to be put to death. Verse 39. And all who were numbered of the Levites were Moses and Aaron numbered. Now here's your priests. At the commandment of the Lord by their families, all the males from a month old and above were 22,000. 22,000. That's going to be an important number here in just a second. Verse 40. And then the Lord said to Moses, Number all the firstborn males of the children of Israel from one month old and above. Now remember, uh, what is it, about a year ago, 
when they were coming up out of Egypt, what was plague number 10 and the final straw for Pharaoh to finally say, King's X, I give up. It was the death of the firstborn. God is seeing this in, 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 in a unique way. The firstborn of Egypt was required of the Lord. So was the firstborn of Israel. Only they didn't die, but God says, they're still mine. That's what he's saying. Then the Lord said to Moses, number all the firstborn males of the children of Israel from a month old and above, and take the number of their names. And you shall take the Levites for me, I am the Lord. Instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel and the livestock of the Levites, instead of all the firstborn among the livestock of the children of Israel. What? Let me rephrase that for you. Hey, the Levites' livestock must be reserved for me, the Lord says, as a substitute for the firstborn livestock of the whole nation. Now watch what God does with this. Verse 42. So Moses numbered all the firstborn among the children of Israel as the Lord commanded him, and all the firstborn males according to the number of names from a month old and above, and those who were numbered of them were 22,000, and there's more, 273. So the total number of Levites is 22,000, or the, the male boys, the firstborn. The, the Levites, pardon me, but the number of firstborn dudes is 22,273. We got a remainder left over. There was an extra 273 fellas that were the firstborn that a Levite could not substitute for. So, because God spared those firstborn with the 10th plague of Egypt, God says, I'm going to use the next best thing to represent life for a life. It's holy to the Lord, and guess what it's going to be? Their wallets. What? Verse 44. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel and the livestock of the Levites instead of their livestock. And the Levites shall be mine, because I am the Lord. Verse 46. And for the redemption of the 273 firstborn, remember that kind of hanging out there, there's not a Levite priest to sort of uh, to, to stand for them, so to speak. Well, what about those guys? Who are more than the number of Levites, by 273 more. Verse 47. You shall take five what? Shekels. For each one individually. You shall take them from the currency of the shekel of the sanctuary, the shekel of 22 geras, which is a certain weight, uh, uh, weight of silver. Verse 48, and you shall give the money with which the excess number of them is redeemed to Aaron and his sons. Are you thoroughly confused, everybody? More or, like, more or less, here's what it is. God says, I want all of Israel to understand something. Somebody is deficient has to be offset by someone who is consecrated. What about the 273 guys that there's not a priest sort of standing in their place? Something has to offset this price deficient with the price paid. It's going to be the form of money to put your Jesus glasses on. Here's Steve before he got saved by Jesus Christ. Was he a price deficient? He is only offset by a price paid. And it seems that the Lord is saying, if it's not a literal human, because killing people for my for atonement, that's not going to work, but I'm going to use the best next thing, your money. <laughs> what? God always equates your money and what you do with it as the greatest indicator of where your heart is. Didn't Jesus say, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Tithing and giving of my time, talent, and resource, God knows what it means to hold down a job. He knows what it means to pay our bills. 
But he also says, if you're not careful, you will work for money. And the more money you get, the hungrier you will become for more money. Here's what I'm going to do. I want you to take it upon yourself in the case of the Old Testament law. I want you to take the first tenth of everything that you make and I want you to give it to me. Why? Because God is poor. Is tithing and giving to the Lord, tithing not just money but time and talent, is that a financial issue by and large? No. Modeled here by these 273 guys, who's going to atone for us? God says, I'm going to use money because money is the telltale sign of where my life is going. Tithing is not a financial thing in the eyes of the Lord. Tithing for the Lord is who do you really trust? And where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Fascinating. We're talking about money here. Verse 46, for the redemption of the 200 and 273 of the firstborn of the children of Israel, who are more than number of the Levites by 273, you shall take five shekels, money. God is equating money, my wallet, with my spiritual condition. Verse 48, and you shall give the money which, with which the excess number of them is redeemed to Aaron and to his son. <clears throat> In place of life, what's the closest thing to my life? My money. Verse 49, oh, by the way, what did Jesus spend his everything on? Raise your hand. Me. Fascinating that God says, hey, what you're doing with your wallet is the greatest indicator of where you are with me. Let's zoom to the end, verse 49. So Moses took the, the redemption money from those who were over and above those who were redeemed by the Levites. From the firstborn of the children of Israel, he took the money, 1,365 shekels, according to the shekel sanctuary. Say that three times real fast. Susan sells seashores by the shekel of the sanctuary. By the way, in case you were wondering, I had to look it up because I wanted to know. 170 pounds of silver. And you know what silver is trading at today? $20 an ounce. This is $54,000. Verse 51, And Moses gave the redemption money to Aaron and his sons according to the word of the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. Amen. Let's all stand together. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for the book of Numbers. I knew we were going to have a great time. Preparing for promise is what we're calling this series. We're getting ready. And the children of Israel are about to head back and head into the promise land. Well, we sort of know what happens. They, they bulk. And God says, all right, you're going to have to wander now for the next 40 years. Lord, I was especially taken by the notion, why the Levites? And then when we read the story, they were the only ones who took God's word serious enough to unsheath the sword. Fascinating. Lord, what's the model for us here at Harvest? It's within us all, Lord, to want to be liked more than we want to be righteous and obedient. We sort of coined the phrase around here, and people look at us funny when we say so. But does God prefer obedience over relationship? The answer, absolutely. And it would seem that before God can build a priest or a leader in God's house that's going to be powerful and unflappable, one of the first things they have to settle is this. If it comes to my very best friend, if they're not doing it how God's word says, Matthew 18, I got to say something. And it's my opinion that the enemy loves biblical, or I should say typical church fellowships. Loves people to go camping and hanging out and Bible studies and 
all the things. And I kind of think the enemy encourages. He, he understands that if people knit their hearts together in relationship, if one of those relationships that you are knit to is an open door to sin, all God has to do to take you down is poke at that person's open door and rebellious heart. And when it comes out of their mouth, they're grinding on somebody in triangulation. I can't, I can't say anything to them. They're my friend. Then you're not a Levite, so to speak. God's not mad at you. But God is saying, I can't use you like I'd like to. So Lord Jesus, I want to lift up all those in any sort of leadership here at Harvest. I pray, Father, that all of us understand that powerful model that the Levites were built on as leaders in the church is because they had the ability to get the word out and do Matthew 18 to prefer God's word and obedience to God's word over relationships. That way, the enemy's going to have a harder time taking them down. I pray, Father, that all of our fellowships here at Harvest have a similar notion. That, Lord, we prefer obedience to God's word over relationship. We might be having a slam in time, but what if it's connecting on the wrong stuff? Lord, your Bible is the most important thing here at Harvest. And I pray, Father, that always, always, that is reiterated and always reestablished. In Jesus' name, and all the Levites said, amen. <laughs> amen. Amen, amen. Hey, God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday.